let's turn to uh, Matthew 13 and let's read verse 45 and 46, uh, the pearl of great price. Let's consider uh, this parable of our Lord Jesus. Our Lord said here, again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant man seeking goodly pearls, who when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. First, we want to notice that this parable begins with the same eight words, uh, eight word phrase of our last parable. Again, the parable. So in this parable, the kingdom of heaven is compared uh, or set side by side with one pearl of great price, or we might say a priceless pearl. The finest pearl the merchant had ever seen. This pearl, like the hidden treasure, pictures the kingdom offer, the high or heavenly calling of this gospel age, to join airship with our Lord Jesus in the heavenly kingdom in association with him and blessing all the families of the earth. Since all Jesus' parables were relevant to his hearers, I thought I'd Google pearls in ancient times. And when I did, I found uh, that there were 32,000 results in 0.49 seconds. And so I clicked on the, uh, the link that was titled Pearl History, Pearl Oasis, The Rich History of Pearls. And this is what it said. Since ancient times, the pearl has been a symbol of unblemished perfection. It is the oldest known gem, and for centuries it was considered the most valuable. A fragment of the oldest known pearl jewelry found in the sarcophagus of a Persian princess who died in 520 BC is displayed in the Lover in Paris. Sorry for the bad pronunciation. To the ancients, pearls were a symbol of the moon and had magical powers. In classic Rome, only persons above a certain rank were allowed to wear pearl jewelry. The Latin word for pearl literally means unique, attesting to the fact that no two pearls are identical. And it goes on. So we see that the ma in the master's day, pearls were amongst the most precious and desirable of jewels. That's why the great teacher used this familiar example as his basis for a lesson on the, val the value of the kingdom. Before looking more closely at this parable, let's make a quick comparison between this parable and the last. When we do, we note that the merchant man is looking for goodly pearls, like the miner who looks or he digs up or digs for costly gems. Whereas the man in our first parable isn't looking for treasure, but he finds it anyways. And since both parables begin with the kingdom of heaven is like unto, we think that this can teach us a lesson of the two ways in which we can come into a relationship with God during the gospel age. First, there's the seekers who are seeking after God, and they do find him, as we read in Acts chapter 17 and verse 27. There we read that they should seek the Lord, if happily they might feel after him and find him. And second, Others apparently aren't seeking him at the time, yet they have an experience that opens their eyes to what they need to do. A classical example of that, of course, is Saul on his way to Damascus. We read that story in Acts the ninth chapter. He wasn't seeking the Lord, but the Lord found him. The Lord found him and revealed himself to him and told him what he needed to do. Or picture this, brethren. An individual is sitting on a park bench. This individual has reached 
a low ebb in life, having no apparent purpose or direction. And perchance, someone comes along and says, do you know the Lord? To which inquiry he says, no, tell me about it. And this one has his eyes open to his Savior. He wasn't looking, but the Lord found him, and he found the hidden treasure. The good news is, brethren, as we know, the Lord is in charge of the harvest. He knows those that are his, and he knows how to find them. He knows the way that we take. All right, back to our parable. We've already identified the pearl of great price as the kingdom of God, this high calling of the gospel age. That being said, let's walk through this parable and consider, consider this parable in more detail. Jesus' first statement, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant man seeking goodly pearls. First, an observation. We all have something to sell, something to give away in exchange for goodly pearls. That is, things that are valuable to us in life. In our younger years, we went to school, and we exchanged our time to get instruction, to be educated, to get knowledge. As we got older, we said, now I have to do something with my life to make my way in the world. So we went to work as butchers and bakers and candlestick makers. That is, we gave our time in exchange for money to some occupation or trade. Along that line, one says, I'll be a lawyer, make lots of money, buy a big house, drive a fine car, and get myself a wife and kids. When I walk down the street with my family, people will say, here comes a man of importance. What a fine life he has. That's the prize many are seeking. The pearl that it, in, they intend to buy, that's that they're living for. They're li living for honor and prominence among men. And it's, and it's for this prize that they spend their days, hours, and minutes to attain that pearl. Others more noble-minded don't seek the honor of the world, fame, position, and wealth. Instead, they seek after a good name. That's the pearl, and it's a good one. The wise man says so in Proverbs 22 and verse 1. A good name is rather to be chosen than great riches. I'm reminded of where I first heard this wise adage about the importance of a good name. It was from my father. He made this statement to my little brother. He said, Jeff, you only get one name. The story connected to this statement is this. My father was able to get us summer work at General Motors. This wasn't an easy task for my father, who was a common laborer. Because there were few job openings, and they typically went to the sons and daughters of those who wore white collars, foremen and general foremen and so on. But dad was well-liked, and he had a few connections in the plant. And he used them to get us work. First Dave, then myself, then Jerry. When Jeff's turn came, dad didn't get him a job. When Jeff asked why, dad replied, Jeff, you only get one name. You see, the year before, Jeff and a few of his high school friends were hired to do outside cleanup work at a big apartment complex. And their supervisor, was a was a, of a mean and surly type. He was he was not the nicest of guys. He didn't treat them well. So after a week, they all quit. Dad reminded Jeff of that, and he told him that he carried his name, and you only get one name. Well, the following year, my dad got Jeff a job at General Motors, and Jeff didn't quit. So. For some, a good name is rather to be chosen than great riches. That's the pearl they seek after. Or as the wise man says in Ecclesiastes 7.1, a good name is better than precious ointment and the day of death than the day of one's birth. But for us, brethren, 
who have found the great pearl, we would rather suffer for righteousness sake than win a good name among men. Because we, the overcomers of this gospel age, have been promised a new name, haven't we? Indeed, we have, and here's the promise. To him that overcometh, I will give him a white stone, and in that stone, a new name, written which no man knoweth, save he that receiveth it. That's from Revelation 2 and verse 17. Our new name written on the stone suggests our bridegroom's name and our special individual relationship with him, the great king of kings. That certainly will be a good name, will it not be, brethren? Returning to the goodly pearl, we see that some seek the pearl of stardom on the gridiron, the football field, or the baseball diamond, or the hardwood, that is the basketball court, or the ice, and so on. These spend their time, their blood, sweat, and tears, seeking this prize of fame and fortune, hoping to hear the roar of large crowds, to see their face on a playing card, their jersey retired, in their name in the Hall of Fame. Another might say, I'll be a great plastic surgeon. I know I want to be known far and wide for saving the careers of movie stars by keeping their faces young and wrinkle-free. Wrinkle That's my ambition. And for that, they spend all their time and energy attaining that prize. Another says, I love music and I love to sing best. It makes me happy, so I will be a great singer. With that pearl in mind, she spends her time and strength and money mastering this great art. Everything goes into singing because that's her one ideal. And so we see that each person has some ideal, some goodly pearl in life that he or she labors towards, and this is a good thing. It is, in fact, what good parents, how good, what good parents do to guide their children toward proper noble ideals in life. These are goodly pearls. Brethren, before we came to the Lord, we all had some ideals or aspirations of our own. Some were more valuable and some less. Some more noble and some less. I was one who wanted to be that ball player who spent his time hitting and chasing baseballs in packed stadiums. I went to college chasing that goodly pearl. That's how I became a teacher. When I finally had to choose a major, I thought, well, maybe I could be a teacher. Then I could coach sports because sports is what I love. The counselor said the only teaching jobs were in special education. So I signed up. I wish it was a no, I wish it was nobler than that. I wish I could say I chose this profession because I really wanted to help those who needed my help the most. But the Lord knows us before we know him and, direct, and directs our path. He supplies the lessons we need to bless us and shape our character. Looking back, I see that some of the greatest examples and lessons in patience, kindness, loyalty, childlike acceptance, and love, I was privileged to know that I, that I was taught by the Lord uh, have come in connection with the kids I was privileged to know during those 30 years. As I was studying this lesson, I thought, what are some of the goodly pearls the brethren in our class in Oakland County have exchanged their time and influence for? This is what I came up with. We have skilled tradesmen, graphic artists, musicians, secretaries, housewives, an engineer, an accountant, a writer, a teacher, a laborer, a landscaper, and a medical records keeper. These are some fine pearls. Good ambitions to do important work to make a difference and to live good life, a good life. And any one of these could dedicate their life to being the very best at what they do. And that would be a noble and worthy way to spend their time 
and it would no doubt make this world a better place to live. But when we came into Christ, brethren, when we heard the gospel, the good news about the wonderful high calling open now, we, we then had the grandest ideal of all. We found the pearl of great price, of greatest value, and we gave all we had to purchase it. All the other pearls, the pearls of being a great tradesman or graphic artist or musician or secretary or engineer or accountant or writer, housewife, teacher, laborer, landscaper, medical records keeper or something else, all these became unimportant or trivial, insignificant in comparison to this great pearl that was so large, so wonderful, and so priceless. This great pearl, this great high calling is what the gospel sets before us. Our first reaction was, is it possible for us to get such a pearl as that? We, and we still think in our heads and sometimes we say, out, say it out loud. How could this be? And what does it mean to be called to glory, honor, and immortality, to the divine nature, to sit with our Lord in his throne. It's hard to imagine, hard to take in, but this is the price, prize offered the kingdom, a share with our Lord Jesus in blessing all the families of the earth. And not only that, we will share with our Lord in all his future glory and honor, whatever that might be, this is the pearl of great price, brethren. And we, we can believe it because our Lord clearly told us this story in this parable of the merchant man, seeking goodly pearls and by many more plain statements. Brethren, you and I were seeking something valuable to exchange our time and influence for. But when we came to see this one thing, this choicest of all pearls, we were so delighted with it that we gladly sold everything we had to buy it. Like the merchant, we said, I will give every, anything, no everything to have this pearl. Then the Lord said, that's good because that's the exact asking price. Now, if you said, I really want this great pearl, so I'll give you everything except the very smallest amount that I need to hold back for myself. To this, the Lord would say, no deal. Then he'd point to his beloved son who gave much more than we have to give. And he would say to us, consider my son. He delighted to sell all he had. He left his heavenly glory. And then he gave up his perfect human life to purchase this pearl of great price. That's the pattern, he would say, whether it's a lot or a little, according to worldly estimations, it must be a willing sacrifice of your all. You don't have much to give, our father would say, but this great pearl is for sale. If you appreciate it, you can have it this deal of a lifetime. That being said, the question is, how do we practically go about selling all that we have to buy this great pearl? The answer, to answer that question, we turn to a familiar story, the story of the rich young nobleman, which is found in Matthew, the 19th chapter, verses 16 through 30. It's a great story, but we won't read it. The friends will remember that the question that the nobleman had on his mind that he asked Jesus was, what good thing must I do that I may have eternal life? And cutting right to the chase, Jesus ultimately said, if you want to be perfect, go sell everything you own, Give the money to the poor, and you will have riches in heaven. Then come and be my follower. 
The nobleman's price for riches in heaven, this pearl of great price, was everything. Sell everything you own, give the money to the poor, and you will have riches in heaven. Then come follow after me. But this was too much for the young man because he was very rich. So he went away sad. So how does this help us answer our question? How do we practically go about selling all that we have to buy the pearl of great price, joint heirship in the kingdom with our Lord? Well, if the young nobleman had accepted this offer, Jesus would have explained how to practically go about the business of selling all he had. Explain to him that since all you have is now the Lord's, you are now a steward of all these possessions and talents. So you must use them wisely to the best possible advantage in my service to feed the poor. To feed the poor doesn't necessarily mean feeding the hungry with the bread that you bake or you buy uh, off the store shelf. But first, or most importantly, feed the spiritually hungry with the bread of life. In short, it means to spend ourselves for the highest good of others, doing good unto all men as we have opportunity, especially the household of faith. Not for present reward, but to receive the master's approval. To attain the kingdom, the great pearl, we must take up our cross daily and follow after our Lord Jesus. We must travel this narrow way of sacrifice motivated by our love for God and our desire to bless our neighbor. This labor of love and sacrifice for others will not bring the reward of gratitude in this age. Instead, it will bring ingratitude and, and even persecution as it did our master. But we are to count it all joy. Why? Because this is the price we must pay for this pearl of great price. A consecration of our all to the Lord doesn't mean that all of our time and possessions should be used exclusively in religious work. For instance, our family obligations are part of our stewardship that our Lord expects us to give proper attention to, as the Apostle Paul says in 1 Timothy 5 and verse 8. But if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel or unbeliever. Brother Russell makes a comment in the sixth volume on page 577. He says, we are not to rob our families of things needful for their proper care. If we have children, their, their need of proper care is more than just food and clothing and, and a home to live in. They need to be properly nurtured and instructed, not just intellectually, but especially morally and religiously. The apostle also instructs parents in 2 Corinthians 12 and verse 14 to plan ahead, to lay up for their children for the uncertainties of life, possibly having a life insurance uh, policy or a special savings account in case you should be uh, gone and not able to care for. Along that line, the wise man instructs us to follow the example of the ant. Proverbs 6.6, 6, go to the ant, thou sluggard, consider her ways, and be wise. We find that the ant, we find the ant laying up a good supply of nourishment for its prospect, uh, prospective young, and so we ought to lay up for our children in their developmental years. We see then that making provision for our children, considering their future to some extent is part of our stewardship with the Lord's goods. And that goes for wives and elderly parents and others as well. We are to provide things honest 
in the sight of all men, Romans 12, 17. That means that each of us, as the Lord's stewards, are to continually seek to know from his instruction book, the great book of instruction, the Bible, what would please him, the decisions we ought to make. And the answers or instructions will not be the same for every steward because our, all of our circumstances are varied. We see then that the proper care of the wife and children and aged parents and others is recognized by God and should be met by all in a reasonable manner. That being said, we must be careful not to be too extravagant or wasteful in this direction in a way that would interfere with the use of the Lord's goods in the chief work of our life. That is the proclamation of the gospel, the good tidings of the kingdom. Brethren, that's the instructions our Lord may have given to the young nobleman concerning the selling of all that he had if he properly responded. These same instructions apply to us, those who have agreed to sell all to buy the great pearl, our place, in the kingdom of heaven. What a parable this is, dear brethren, what a story. Whether a man is wealthy or poor, learned or ignorant, influential or not, this kingdom pearl of great price is yours if you will give your little all. You can be of the kingdom class, the bride of Christ, one of the anointed who will rule and bless all the world of mankind. You, brethren, can attain on to glory, honor, and immortality, the divine nature. Amazing, but true. That brings us to the end of our parable. And for the remainder of our time, we want to consider the treasure our Lord instructed us to seek after and store up, found in Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 to 21 that Brother Julius was talking about a little early during our fellowship. Matthew 6, 19 to 21. Our Lord says here, lay not up for yourself treasures upon earth where moth and rust does corrupt and where thieves break through and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Webster defines treasure as something of great worth or value, that which brings joy, delight, pleasure, comfort, and so on. Some verbs used to describe treasure are uh, that which bring that which we cherish, prize, hold dear. Jesus defines or identifies our treasure as the place our heart where our heart is. That is what inspires our life, where our thoughts, our hopes, and our plans are centered. The great teacher also differentiates between earthly and heavenly treasures. Earthly treasures, he says, are transitory. They're temporary, brief, short-lived, here today, gone tomorrow, eaten up by moss or rust, or stolen away by thieves. Heavenly treasures, he says, are eternal, everlasting, endless, forever, rust-proof, moth-proof, time-proof, can't be eaten up cannot be stolen away. Most people have treasures, dreams, high hopes they seek after that they think will bring true joy and happiness. But most don't find or accomplish their dreams and are left feeling empty or unfulfilled. And the few that do aren't satisfied when they get there because earthly treasures only bring temporary or short-lived joy and happiness. Let me give you an example, a true story. We'll call this story 
living the dream. Six years ago, we got in the mail an invitation for our 40th class reunion. We hadn't gone to a class reunion since our fifth year. And I wasn't planning on going to this one, but I got a phone call from a good friend of mine uh, from high school, a real good guy, Brad Northman. He said, Dan, you got to go. I just, I just want to see you. Why don't you go? So Connie and I went. Uh, it was right around the corner from our house, less than a mile away. So uh, we walked in uh, to the hall, and there was a table. And they were giving you your name tags. Of course, everybody looked different, no hair and things. So everybody could recognize one another. So we were getting our name tags. And suddenly there was a voice. And that voice said, Connie Monette, or not Monette, Connie Cassisi, like you just walked out of the yearbook. And I looked back, and who was that? That was Frank the class president, talking to my wife now. And he was always a smooth talker, Frank was. So we got our name tags and Brad had saved us a table near the front. And so we went and sat down and we caught up, we talked about what we've been doing the past you know, 30, 40 years. And uh, who came and sat down at the table with us? Well, if you guessed Frank, the president of the class, you are right. He sat down right next to us, right there. And as the conversations went around the table, Frank volunteered that he was living the dream. And then he went on to paint a picture of what that happy life looked like. Describing the perfect life, which started out every day by waking up and sipping coffee on his deck while he looked out onto the Atlantic Ocean. He even generously invited us to join him anytime and enjoy the good life, his little corner of paradise. Well, as the night went on and more conversation was had, we learned that as good as life was for Frank, it wasn't perfect. His happiness wasn't full and satisfying. He told us of an only son who was a drug addict, who, had, who he had to kick out of the house with tears because his son was dangerous. He had to change the locks. He had to put a restraining order out. He had to keep his son from breaking into the house and hurting them. Brethren, that ends our story. Life on earth is truly a blessing from God. And there is happiness to be found and joy to be had. But everyone finds out sooner or later that the happiness this world offers is shallow, second rate, fleeting at best, here today and gone tomorrow. Nine words describe life built upon these earthly treasures. These nine words are vanity of vanities, saith the preacher, all is vanity. This is from Ecclesiastes 12, 8. This conclusion comes from King Solomon, of course, one of the most successful men from the world standpoint that ever lived. He had every comfort and blessing, the, we the wealth, that wealth, power, honor, and fame, and even superhuman wisdom could bestow upon a man. And he applied all of these for his own gratification in life. He enjoyed every luxury and tried every experience. And in the end, he pronounced the whole experience sore travail. By a wasted life, Solomon proved the vanity of every course. Solomon's conclusion is also man's conclusion. It's the poor world's refrain at the end of life. And God wisely allows man to come to this conclusion. 
That's the object of the permission of evil, as we know. As we read in Ecclesiastes 1, 13 and 3, 10. There Solomon says, I have seen the sore travail. I have seen the travail which God had given to the sons of men to be exercised in it. This experience will make man ready for the duty of submission in the millennial kingdom, where they will be blessed by God with life and true happiness by keeping his commandments. As already stated, Solomon, by his wasted life, proved the vanity of every course except for one. The one he speaks of in the second to last verse of the book of Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes 12, 13. And there he says, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. And here it is, fear God and keep his commandments for this is the whole duty of man. Brethren, we alone by the Lord's grace are those who fear God and keep his commandments. We are those who lay up for ourselves treasures in heaven. Our hearts are set upon these things, God's things, which are true, real, and satisfying. These things which will not vanish or fade away. And brethren, the Lord has given us this unique opportunity to lay up for ourselves treasures in heaven to further develop our relationships with God and our Lord Jesus, our brethren, our families, and the world around us. Most of us have been given time like we've never had before, concentrated time in isolation. We know that this experience isn't by chance because all our experiences are orchestrated by God for our good as new creatures. As the apostle says in this very precious promise in Romans 8, 28, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. As we look about us, we see the anxiety and panic in the world, which calls to our mind the apostles' words in Luke, the 21st chapter in verse 26. Here the apostle says, men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. Brethren, the number of questions on our Bible Today website, the class website, has increased dramatically in the last couple of months. Many are wondering, is this the end of the world? How do I get ready? Are we close to the Lord's return? Is the rapture about to happen? Many questions along these lines are coming in. In these difficult times, our Lord instructs us, brethren, as to how we should react. He says in Luke 21, 28, and when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads for your redemption or your deliverance draweth nigh. Brethren, this birth pang that came so suddenly upon the world has reminded us to look upward towards God and to our Lord Jesus from whence our blessings come. It reminds us to use the time provided to deepen our relationship, to draw nearer to our loving Heavenly Father and to our beloved Savior, our Lord and Savior Jesus, to take the time provided for increased prayer and study and meditation. And to that end, Sister Connie and I are finding time spent considering our Lord's, Lord's life and ministry to be a great blessing by reading the life of Christ. And the friends probably are familiar with that book. I believe the uh, Chicago Bible students print it, but it's a series of reprint articles that takes you from 
the birth of Jesus all the way through his life and ministry to his ascension into heaven. Brethren, as we watch and pray and lift up our heads to understand the events unfolding around us in our, stu in our study and consideration of prophecy, the Lord will help us to see how these current events might fit into the timeline of the end time events that will bring about the kingdom of God. And the overarching blessing of our consideration of prophecy is the great comfort that comes to us by the constant reminder that God is at the helm. And the grand outcome of the trouble is the establishment of Messiah's kingdom where we will be with the Lord and all will be blessed. Daily thoughts upon the kingdom helps to center our hearts' affections there. This helps to develop in us an attitude of expectancy, of longing and readiness for the kingdom. In this unique experience, God has provided us time to take a closer look at ourselves, in our relationships, with our family, with our brethren, and with the world around us. Brethren, we know that our true self, our true character, is that person that stares back at us in the mirror, and that person that we find in the home. So, this life of isolation gives us an opportunity to take a close look at ourselves. How are we acting in our homes? What words are we speaking? Then we can make repairs as we look and see where we fall short. We can work on improving our character in the area of patience and kindness and compassion and concern for those we are with. This is a good time to think about our brethren that we normally have fellowship with, to consider how they're doing, what needs do they have temporally and spiritually. Who's alone? Who's anxious? Who's in need of encouragement? And we can make phone calls and we can send text messages and emails and we can also visit them, of course, staying six feet apart. But we have these privileges to show that proper love and concern. And when we're outside our home, in our backyards, when we're walking about, when we're in the store picking up some food, we want to remember that we, we are a spectacle unto the world, as the Apostle Paul reminds us in 1 Corinthians 4.9. For we are made a spectacle in the margin in the King James's theater or a show unto the world and to the angels and to men. Another verse that comes to mind is 2 Corinthians 3 2. Ye are our epistles written in our hearts, known and read of all men. The best epistle we know, dear friends, for the world. Uh, and the most val even more valuable than the Bible itself, of course, is our Christian lives lived before men. So as sons of God and ambassadors for Christ, our privilege is to do good unto all men as we have opportunity. And this is a time when those around us in the world, those represented by the field of our parable, who we've pledged our lives to die for as part of the sin offering, these members of the groaning creation need our little good, our little cheer and encouragement more than ever. We must not only be mindful of that, but we must be filled with the cheer that comes from above. We have to put it in ourselves in order to give it to those in need around us. Here's an excellent way to do good to others that doesn't require money or a great deal of time or energy. We found this great suggestion in reprint 5357. And the reprint's titled, Little Ways of Doing Good to Others. Here's the, uh, here's the paragraph we chose. One of the easiest ways 
is to look happy ourselves and thus inspire happiness in others. A person who goes about looking miserable is not likely to make others feel happy. But if we cannot always be very happy, let us look as happy as we can. And thus, we will be doing good to a great many people whom we meet throughout the day. This we can do even if we have no money with which to help others. Look happy and try thus to make them happy. And secondly, if we have no money, we can give a kind word, a smile, a pleasant tone, a little civil, uh, civilry, civility, excuse me, a little civility wherever proper. All such little courtesies of life are means of doing good and may bring a ray of sunshine into the lives of a great many people, the majority of whom are unfavorably situated. The light of the knowledge of the glory of God does not yet shine into their hearts. They are dark within, gloomy, foreboding, fearful. They know not God, and what they know of their fellow men is the knowledge of selfishness. What a privilege is ours, dear brethren, to do good unto all men in this simple way. And when you're out and about, don't forget to carry a few tracks. A dear sister testified on Wednesday that she was, she was able to have a conversation with a neighbor on her walk around the block. Then she was able also to leave her with a track filled with God's precious promises. Remember, dear brethren, it's times like these when men are more apt to be serious-minded, looking for answers, and therefore more willing to consider the things of God and more likely to receive the balm of Gilead for broken hearts, the word of God, as the psalmist reveals in Psalm 34, 18. The Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart, and saveth such as be of a contri contrite spirit. Here's an excellent quote from reprint 1820 in connection with this verse. His love and his precious promises come like a sweet balm of Gilead to those who, sad and disappointed, in the struggle of life, come to Christ for rest and comfort, for life and healing. Many storm-tossed mariners upon seas, oceans, discouraged and despairing, bereft of all hope, have found that these very experiences were the means of leading them to the heavenly to the haven of eternal refuge. There alone, true blessings and safety can be found. There alone, the real treasure, far exceeding the choicest treasures of earth. So let us be ready, dear brethren, to share our treasures of hope of the heavenly kingdom and its blessings for all. That's what the world needs to hear more than ever. brethren. By the Lord's grace, we have found the pearl of great price, and we saw that all other pearls, all other treasures are insignificant in comparison. And now it's our privilege and duty to help others find this great pearl. And in these days of stress and uncertainty, when more and more men feel that everything is falling apart, when nothing earthly is sure, when trust in governments and politicians religion and religious leaders, bankers and financial systems are all crumbling. And when we see our social system coming apart with increased animosity between the rich and the poor, uh, races and genders and so on, in these days of increased trouble, when fear with distress is on every hand, let us, dear brethren, focus on the solution, the silver lining in the cloud of trouble, the kingdom the pearl of great price, our high calling. We've been given this unique time by the Lord to help us focus on winning this heavenly prize, a time to focus on our relationships with the Lord, with the brethren, and with our families and the world around us in our pursuit of making our calling and election sure. At such a time as this, dear brethren, let us call to mind often just how blessed we are to be 
safely sheltered under the shadow of the Almighty, where we have this superhuman care and protection in all troubles. And let us appreciate all the more just how precious is the treasure which we have laid up in heaven, a treasure that is safe from all storms of life, where neither moth nor rust nor corruption, and where thieves do not break through and steal. Finally, brethren, we end where we began with our Lord's words of admonition to all of us, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and its righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. May the Lord add his blessing.